Science and Medicine Innovation. My name is Anka Toma. I'm the Executive Director of the European Patients Forum, and I will be your moderator today. We have with us uh, uh, two expert speakers uh, on uh, who will give us various perspectives on um, the use of artificial intelligence in medicines innovation. I will start with a very short, very short promise introduction on um, on why we we at DPF work on artificial intelligence, why this matters to us and to our community, what uh, we are doing to build capacity, and uh, and then I will hand over the microphone and the camera and the floor to our speakers. So I will now. Uh, share my screen. I will try to be okay. Perfect. Uh, okay. This should look okay. I hope I get some encouraging nod if it does, because I can't see what you see. Um, the European patients for oh, I should probably do this as well. There you go. Um, the European Patients Forum, I think we need little introduction since you are uh, participating in our webinar. We are the umbrella patient organization uh, or umbrella organization of patient organizations in Europe. Uh, and our vision is for a Europe where patient organizations are partners, valued partners in creating sustainable, uh, equitable, person-centered, accessible healthcare systems based on patient's unique expertise. Uh, so we work uh, towards that through, um, through well cooperation, advocacy, education, and as you can see today, through capacity building. What is artificial intelligence? Uh, we are using here the um, European Commission definition, which is relatively long, but there's a reason for that. But it can be shortened uh, to the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines. It's important to patients because the development of AI-enabled tools in healthcare will have an impact on their lives. Uh, it, there is a promise of better health and better care for patients. Uh, but there's also challenges um, looming along with this process. And, um, and uh, in order to be able to provide an informed patient perspective on the development of these tools, we believe that the patient community must have the capacity and the understanding to engage in debates in this otherwise complex area. So we have started a capacity building initiative on AI, um, which is supported by the European AI Fund, um, which includes a knowledge hub on our website, a series of webinars, the fourth of which uh, is happening today. And we have another one uh, planned for the, for in a few weeks time. Shortly uh, before the end of this year, we will launch two commissioned uh, research reports, one on EU policy and legislative framework on AI, and another one on the patient perspective of AI. And we work toward, uh, to, to with our digital health working group and with uh, our members interested in the topic to develop a policy statement and policy recommendations next year. We are here today uh, to talk about the use of artificial intelligence in medicines innovation. A few housekeeping rules to, to kick off with. Uh, please note that this uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, please uh, also, um, but I see the, this is, this is a very disciplined audience that we have. Please keep your microphone muted when you do not speak. And please indicate uh, if you'd like to ask a question in the chat. The way we will go about it today is we will first uh, uh, hear the presentations of our guest speakers. 
and um, we will take after each of them we can take a, a short question or two for clarification but we will keep the more substantive discussion uh, uh, towards the end because it's entirely possible that uh, questions may be addressed through the presentation if you indicate your uh, wish to ask a question i will give you the the floor um Zoom is very helpful in that way because uh, your your hand raised or your comment will be in order. So it's going to be first come, first served. And depending on time, of course, we may not be able to address all the questions, uh, but we do promise that we will do our very best. The webinar today is scheduled to take about one hour and we aim to close on time uh, at uh, at 3.30. CET were in Brussels. Our speakers today, and I thank them very much for taking the time to come and educate us about uh, AI and medicine innovation. Luis Pinheiro, who is a doctor in pharmacy and a senior epidemiology expert at the European Medicines Agency, and Lisbeth Geris, um, Lisbeth Geris, uh, the director of the Virtual Psycho Physiological Human Institute and a research professor um, in some pretty cool science stuff <laughs> at the University of Liège and the KU Leuven. Um, with this, I close now. I don't believe I forgot any housekeeping rules. And over to you, Luis, you go first. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm happy to be here to, to represent EMA. I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a second. Uh, so just, yes. Screen one. Okay. Display settings. It should be up. I think your screen should be up very soon. It's not up yet, though. Is it? Is it now? Is it working now? I'm looking at my colleagues. I don't see it now, but I, we can try to put it up ourselves. Wait, give me a second. I'll do it. Perfect. Thank you. Oops, I'm jumping all around. Okay, give me just a second. I think uh, I need to, yeah. That's the Friday um, Friday setup for, for uh, presentations, right? It takes a little longer than what should, um, should be the case. Um, anyways, so the first thing I wanted to do, yeah, here we go, is, is, is give the title, oops, moving all over the place, just give the title of my presentation, and that's Application of AI in Medicines, and what I'm going to provide today is a perspective from the EU Medicines Regulator, um, and I've been introduced. Uh, my name is Luis Pinay. I work in the Data Analytics and Methods Task Force at the European Medicines Agency. There's a little bit of disclaimer. That's a pro forma. Nothing special here. I have, I've always worked for regulatory authorities or academia, so I have nothing to disclose. Mm -hmm. So what what am I going to try to do with this presentation? So I'd like to walk you through the promise of artificial intelligence for the benefit of public health, and also look at the challenges that we need to overcome to fulfill that promise. And a lot of those challenges, I'm going to focus on the risk side. Obviously, there's things around uh, skill set and, and uh, technology and so on, but I'm going to focus on the risks. Uh, and then I'm going to walk you through the drivers for digital and AI transformation for the European Medicines Regulatory Network. So I work for the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, but the European Medicines Agency works in a network system with member states, so the regulatory authorities from each member state of the European Union 
plus the EMA constitute the European Medicines Regulatory Network. I'm going to very briefly touch upon the precursors of legislation on AI in the European Union. There's a reason for that, and it's mostly around the principles. And I wanted to kind of focus on the principles um, in, in this talk. And then I'm going to show you what the next steps in the ERMR, in the journey of the European Medicines Regulatory Network will be. Okay. So, what is artificial intelligence and promises and risks? And um, and thank you for the for the uh, for the uh, for the definition that was presented earlier on. It's it's the definition of the high level expert working group uh, of, on artificial intelligence of the Commission, and um, it is it is uh, something that was uh, born out. Uh, um, with some difficulty, it's not the best, the easiest thing to uh, present. It's not um, something that um, is easy to remember. Uh, what we often say in more of a layman language is that artificial intelligence is a catch-all term for a collection of novel technologies and methods. And fundamentally, what we're looking at is instead of uh, having a human coding the rules for an algorithm, computers deduce that those rules from the data and typically this is data that has been curated in some form so there's there's somebody classified the data in in some way um, in my talk i'm going to use artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning as interchangeable terms i'm also going to use a lot of algorithm to mean like the byproduct or the creation from these um, if there's a question on a specific uh, uh, point, I'm happy to, um, to, uh, to uh, explain, but I'm gonna sacrifice a little bit of, of specificity to improve the fluidity of the communication. So what are the promises? In terms of, in general terms, um, there's two big promises from artificial intelligence. One of which is efficiency of processes, just how we can use AI to uh, leverage automation, make things more efficient, uh, scale those processes. And on the other hand, providing deeper insights in, into data. And um, that means a number of things. And I think I have an example later on that. On the other hand, there's risks. Now there's, there's certainly something, so I've been in several presentations where um, people producing artificial intelligence don't like the expression displacement or replacement of human activities. But in reality, that is what happens, not necessarily a full replacement, but a certain level of displacement by automated systems or you can call it data-driven methods, and those carry risks that can and should be mitigated. So in healthcare, the promise is, I like to split it in four areas, obviously greater efficiency, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, the automation of processes and addressing scalability issues, fundamentally, the ability to do more things and faster. There's also the advantage of reducing error because you facilitate access to information. Information currently is not only varied, but it's very fast. So you need to have access to, to information that is immediate and artificial intelligence can provide the information at the fingertip. On the other hand, exposing data, and that is really transforming a sort of unstructured data like text data into um, structured data or doing something called reducing the dimensionality of the data. And what's that? So in the past, we used to have systems or analyses that would rely on, on tabulated data that had uh, a hundred or a few hundred of variables on, on, a, on a person, on an exposure. Currently, we have big data, and that means thousands, tens of thousands of variables. And this is far more than what a human can, can uh, comprehend. And often what you can do is get artificial intelligence to summarize that information, and that is called reducing dimensionality. 
So structuring and summarizing information is important um, as well. And finally, expanding insights. And here I focus on what matters to me, my, or to the area that I work on. And that is um, the fundamentally, I'm not gonna go over these because I think they're a bit too technical, fundamentally predicting the probability of events. Typically, some sort of risk. So, what are our regulatory drivers? And, and I think there's four that I'd like to share with you. And we typically talk about three in the agency. And very recently, we we're talking about this with the uh, with the executive director. So, on one hand, we want to be able to do pro what we call process analytics. And that means just improving the efficiency of our own processes. If we can do more. Uh, with less resources or with the same resources, it's important for us. So if you think about, for instance, the COVID pandemic, um, once we started having vaccination, uh, the number of reports on the vaccine shot up tremendously. So we have the whole world being exposed to a, a drug and people are reporting a lot of information and that's useful for us. But we still have the same people doing pharmacovigilance. So you still have the same reports as you were getting, the same baseline number of reports. And then you have an extra, significantly large extra that comes through the pandemic. And you don't have time to recruit people to manage that. So one way we can do, and we can kind of address that issue is by doing process analytics. The other point I would like to flag is healthcare data analytics. And that's mostly where I'm at at the agency. And that's about structuring information and increasing insights into data to inform decision-making at the agency. The um, other bit and an important bit is the regulatory submission. So um, we also have to, to, as a regulatory agency, regulate the applications of artificial intelligence in medicines. And for us, it's really important to be able to leverage artificial intelligence if that helps create value for public health. So for us, it's important to be capable of, of doing the regulation at, at a really good level of proficiency. And finally, external collaboration. We can't do this alone and we need to be an effective collaborator. And that includes on legislation development, and some examples I put here from ICMRA, which is an international coalition of medicine regulatory authorities. Uh, we contributed to the WHO artificial intelligence ethics report, and we've imputed, imputed um, we've provided input to the uh, EC legislation, uh, mostly on, on the kind of the pharma side of things. So what's what's our experience? I think I think it'd be you know, talking only in hypotheticals is not um, extremely uh, useful. And I'd like to give you a few examples of what we've done in the past. So in process analytics, uh, artificial intelligence has been useful to detect duplicates in neutropigence, which is our uh, database for aggressive reactions. We, we use it to create a system we call PEDAR, which is a personal data recognition. So we, we remove personal data recognition from our, um, uh, the information that we're we're asked for. So if somebody asks a report from us, we provide, we um, take the report and we pass it through PEDAR. And we also automate the extraction of adverse drug information for summaries of product characteristics. In terms of healthcare data analytics, uh, I'll give you two examples, uh, uh, which I think are useful and more. Uh, one is when we looked at uh, what are the, kind of what's the, what, what is the kind of the, the discriminating factors that lead to people abusing prescription opioids. So we're looking at that in the context of what you may recall was the um, opioid pandemic in, in the US. We looked at Europe to see if there was an issue here. And we also use it for a little bit more elaborate things, trying to, for instance, identify patients who were likely impacted from the fact that they had a specific uh, genotype. Right, so it's very difficult. We don't have that information in most of our in most of our databases. So what we want to understand is how much that genotype is affecting the aggressive reactions for this drug, and just to get an estimate of the public health impact. And we did it through an artificial intelligence model. The other bits are in regulatory submissions. 
And we've done, we currently do what we call qualification procedures where companies come to us and say, we would have this method to use artificial intelligence. Um, can you qualify it? It's in, in, in a way, it's almost like an authorization process. There haven't been many, but there have been um, at least three that I've been part of. And then finally, we have something called the business pipeline meetings and innovation task force meetings where companies can come in, companies, academia, not just companies, but academia as well can come in and say, I have this thing that I find interesting. Uh, what do you think about this? What do you think are the potential uh, regulatory concerns and so on? So there's, uh, there's some pitfalls as well. Um, and I think that's important to, to address and, and we could do it by an example. So one of the things you may know if you follow this a little bit is that COVID-19 is the disease with the highest number of published um, machine learning models ever. Um, and, and that sounds good, but then if you think about what the uh, kind of the a look back at that um, amount of models is providing us in terms of information is that none of the models out of 62 models that this uh, group of authors looked at, none of the models were um, identified as having any potential clinical use. So none of the 62 were considered to be useful due to methodological flaws and underlying biases. So, so it's good to uh, it, taking that um, that example, it's good to kind of look at some of the pitfalls. And I put here main pitfalls because there's quite, quite a few more and some of them are very technical, but I basically split them in data, technique and life cycle. And the first one is, is on data. And be, because as I explained, artificial intelligence uses, extracts rules from data. So the algorithms are only as good as the data they are created from. And, and then what you have is that bias can propagate from the data collection to a model's prediction. And if you think about bias, you can think of it as, as uh, bias and fairness as two sides of the same coin. And bias, thinking about bias requires to think about ethics, uh, representativity, uh, data collection processes, and so on. Um, I had a little example. I'm going to skip it in favor of time. I'm happy to give that example in, in the discussion. Um, the other side of the, the other aspect is technique. So machine learning algorithms choose and are chosen based on performance, but a better performing algorithm might not be interpretable by a human. So if you have something like a deep learning model, um, it's, it's just mathematical uh, 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 levels of complexity and it's just very difficult to interpret it. There's ways to make it more explainable, but you won't be able to actually understand the decision behind the model necessarily. The other problem is that models can adjust to the random noise in the data. That's called overfitting. So a model sees things that may happen by random and a person may think this is a random event, but if there's small variations in the model, it might assume, okay, this has an influence in the outcome and, and thus I'm going to include it in, in the model. And data correlated with the output may be included in the model. That's, that's called uh, leaked data. So for instance, you might have heard this example where there's pictures of, um, of, of um, histology uh, results and you'd have certain ruler markings for uh, for when you had the, the cancer, there would be a ruler marking. So basically uh, centimeters there and the model was picking up that and, and would say anything that has a ruler marking basically is a malignancy. Obviously when that model goes live, it's gonna fail terribly because the ruler markings will not be there. And finally, life cycle algorithms are valid on the assumption that the rules from the past don't change. And, and that's never true. So the prediction performance will drop over time. And we know that uh, we, we use uh, the term model drift to, to uh, express that. So the white paper, I might just uh, jump a little bit, but, but the, this is the precursor of the AI Act. And I think the two principles here are extremely important. So we want an ecosystem. So the commission wants an ecosystem of excellence and an ecosystem of trust. And the, the ecosystem of excellence has, has to do with, with that, with the elements related to proficiency, development, 
uh, in Europe, fostering best practices and partnerships across uh, public and, and private um, organizations, whereas trust is both in terms of the risks as well as, as the recognized need to have regulatory, uh, a sort of regulatory framework to support the delivery of uh, benefits with AI. So the European Regulatory Network has, has been preparing also, and we've had three strategic initiatives, the Big Data Task Force, the Regulatory Science Strategy 2025, and the uh, Network Strategy to 2025. And these three, three documents recommended uh, several things. There's several, um, I think 16 uh, different actions that you can split into these topics, learning and skill gaps, methods and guidelines governance initiatives and so on. And we took those and we decided to talk to our stakeholders. And we had a, a, a workshop. Uh, 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 funnily enough, Lisbeth was, was present in the workshop and she gave a great, uh, great talk on, on uh, digital twins. Um, and we had uh, stakeholders from medtech, uh, healthcare professionals. We had patients there and we had consumers uh, represent, kind of fundamentally representing two sides of, of uh, sort of the kind of the, the people that receive care. We had inspectors, we had pharma, general industry, research, academia, innovation network. There was at um, a maximum point, we had 525 people in, in the audience online. And all these people, all these stakeholders had a chance to tell us what their priorities were. And for them, for creating a framework to assess uh, artificial intelligence and developing guidelines was, was a priority. Building those partnerships and international collaborations was a second element. And finally, upskilling the regulatory network. And what we did after that was we mapped those recommendations to actions in the big data steering group, in the MA work plan, and in the um, uh, internal organizational elements we have or structures we have called the AI coordination and AI technical group. And these are those. Uh, we do have two uh, or do organizational in, uh, uh, entities in the agency. The coordination group is more around catalyzing ongoing work across the AI and promoting an oversight, um, whereas the EMA AI technical group, of which I am a co-chair, is more around knowledge sharing, building the capacity in practical AI. So we want to know how to do it to be able to write, well, to reap the benefits from it if, if those are there, but also to be able to regulate um, effectively and, and confidently. Uh, it is also a forum for researching and it's a safe environment for guided practical learning on uh, AI methods and technical aspects. So my final slide is in the next steps and where are we now? So we're around here, obviously, uh, hopefully there's a little uh, the timeline here. So around here, and the next steps, this is the big data steering group work plan for 2025. And you can see four main things in terms of liberals. First, the big data curricular training through the EU Network Training Center. That is uh, a training curriculum that will have three um, aspects, one of which is data science that includes artificial intelligence. Uh, the, scope, uh, the scoping of knowledge sharing for on advanced analytics is another important element. So we want to be able to link up to the AI community at large. The AI community, as you can imagine, has not entirely been focused on healthcare, uh, uh, delivering products and, and uh, having you know, Netflix and, and stuff like that is where most people end up uh, using their skills. It's less uh, uh, clustered in, in, health, in the healthcare uh, arena. The reflection paper we're currently developing uh, will be um, published in Q3 next year. And then after that, depending on what type of considerations we put in the air reflection paper, then we'll move on to develop artificial intelligence guidelines in the pharma sector. That's it, and apologies if I run a little bit uh, beyond my allocated time. Thank you. Many thanks, Luis. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a fantastic overview. I'm wondering if at this point we have any questions for clarification. Uh, if not, we will take uh, discussion questions later.
I think we're good. And we did notice the the question that was asked in chat, which we will address in the um, in the discussion. Now over to Lisbeth Geis, the um, second speaker of today. Uh, by all means, please, Lisbeth. I was Don't muted. forget to unmute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you please confirm that the slides are showing fine? Yes. OK, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Luis. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody, or thank you for uh, for um, having me. I'd be very happy to, to give this talk, uh, which is of a slightly different nature, uh, which I think makes it great uh, for this training. Um, as it is not provided by a specific organization uh, like EMA or by uh, my or from my capacity as a university professor, it's more from my capacity as the current executive director of the VPH Institute. And I wanted to take a second to explain what that is. It is the International Scientific Society for and Silico Medicine. So for everything that has to do with um, modeling and simulation in, in healthcare. Um, and we also have our counterpart, uh, which is a collaboration with industry in the Avicenna Alliance, uh, which is also a nonprofit, uh, which is 50-50 industry and academia. And why, is it, why did I want to emphasize what organizations uh, I, I represent here? It is because of this triangle. You've had in the previous trainings, you've, had, uh, you've heard from users and, and experts uh, on the technical elements. You've also now just heard about uh, policies and incentives uh, from Luis. And I think uh, what is really important is also the role that a community can play. And you have a community like ours for in silico medicine. Of course, you also have the community of, of the EPF um, that is there. And what I will talk about today is first something about the models. Um, so the digital uh, examples, the challenges that we face and how we try to uh, get all the stakeholders uh, together to realize the promise of personalized medicine with the AI uh, being a part of that. So starting with the concept of digital twins, which was uh, for some people maybe a new term in the title, it is a concept that comes from Industry 4.0. So where you have a virtual representation of a physical object or a process, and that is in direct interaction with its um, uh, digital, with, with its uh, physical object. So there is a direct link. There are sensors on the physical object that can be read in by the computer model. The computer model does a prediction and that gives that prediction back to the, the physical objective so that it can see if the process runs well and smoothly. And so this is used in airplanes and in, in a lot of uh, industry parts. But recently uh, we've started using the term also in healthcare. Whereas in healthcare, we kind of let go of this real-time interaction between the physical and the digital part because it doesn't always make sense. Uh, you don't always want to have direct feedback. You don't always have the, the readouts that you can have. So we use digital twins in healthcare more as a, as a synonym for personalized medicine. Now, what I also want to say is that uh, in silico or the use of computer modeling and simulation is actually a spectrum. So this one is particularly today talking about AI, AI, which is data driven. So you start from the data, you don't put in any of the knowledge that you have acquired on a process or a, a product, um, and you just let the data uh, do its thing. Whereas on the other hand of the spectrum, you have what we call white box models. Those are based on knowledge. So you, you uh, know how fracture healing works. You write that down in the story and then you translate this from English into mathematics, just the same way as you would translate it from English to French. You can translate it from English into mathematics and then you solve that computer model um, and you get a result. And that is what we call a mechanistic or a white box models. Now, in reality, often you would have to find some kind of compromise because uh, for specific applications in healthcare, for rare diseases, you don't have a lot of data available to do AI. So you need to import what you already know from the mechanism side, what you already know from the process to uh, supplement uh, the data that you do have. And sometimes when you make a model, it is really very heavy and you can't calculate very well with it. It takes too much time. So we make a simplified version, a surrogate model, that is then using AI principles to make the model easier to compute and maybe use in direct clinical uh, practice. So as, as usual, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but what, what one thing that is important is that 
when using computer models and simulations, whether it's AI or whether it's other technologies, it should be the question and the application that determine what kind of technology that you're going to use. And I'll, I'll give now three um, examples of, of how this could be used. One example is what you see here. It is uh, looking at the effect of drugs on the electromechanics of the heart. So the heart is a very complex organ where you have electricity, where you have mechanics that all go hand in hand. And here a model was made of different parts of the heart. And you see the ventricle part and the atria part uh, on the right hand side. And what they are simulating is um, how the electrical potential, that's what you see in the colors, how it spreads across the entire uh, heart and how then uh, drugs can affect the, the, the spread of this, uh, of this electrical potential. Now this can help us to understand if by providing drugs, for instance, to uh, children will have an adverse effect, something that is very hard uh, to test uh, in, in clinical practice. Another way in which uh, you can look at models for the heart is where, this is an example where AI is actually collaborating with uh, more mechanistic forms of modeling. Um, when you have uh, a group of patients, there was a group of patients uh, in Oxford in the hospital that, that got all uh, ECGs uh, measured. And so all of these signals were present. What was then done is that, that they used machine learning to see if there were specific patterns in these uh, patients, so to, to divide them in four different groups. And if they then looked at the medical images of those hearts, they indeed saw that within these groups, the patients had similar characteristics. So machine learning was used to identify in which patient in which group a patient was, but it didn't explain what, why that patient was in that group or what then could be used in terms of drug therapy. So there they took the same medical images, they built them into the models that I, as I just showed on the previous slide, and they uh, tested to see you know, how they could reproduce the, the ECG signal that the patients had uh, when, they, when they were wearing the halter. And they, they found out that indeed there were specific things wrong with certain ion channels or they, they found out what would actually lead to that specific signal for these four different groups. And so the use of the machine learning told us where a patient is, what, was, uh, what the group was, and then the use of this, uh, this mechanistic modeling told us why the patient was in that group. So how come they were in that group and what was then the next step for treatment strategies. And one last example of something completely different um, is uh, the use of agent-based modeling. Agent-based modeling means that we take, um, for instance, in this case, it's the, it's the uh, immune system. We take all the different cells that are involved in the immune system and we make them little agents. That means that they all have specific mechanisms in, by which they can look at the environment, look at other cells and interact with these cells. So there's all kinds of rules for every type of cell. And then we put all of these cells, we, we put them together in a big system, in the immune system, and we let them interact. And then we see what comes out. So this is a real form of artificial intelligence where you start from the rules that we already know, and then you let the system uh, evolve and see what, what comes out. And with this uh, virtual immune system, this has been applied to cases of COVID vaccine design, it has been applied to multiple sclerosis. And the example that I want to show you is how it is used in the design of tuberculosis clinical trials. So tuberculosis clinical trials, this is also a European project. Um, the first step that was done was use the data that is already available, that is the top part of patients having tuberculosis. And you see the load uh, of, the, of the TBC uh, uh, rising over time. Well, this data was used to train the model of the virtual immune system. Then in the second step, you had patients that were undergoing treatment. So also this information was used to further train the model. So then you have a validated patient-specific model of the, the treatment. And then there are two things that you can do with it. Either you take uh, physical patients and you, uh, you model uh, or you make a model of that patient uh, in order to try and understand uh, what would be uh, the good time to intervene or what would be the expected outcome of a treatment if the treatment is working. Or on the other hand, you could do an in silico clinical trial instead of a, a real uh, trial in actual patients to further optimize the, the vaccine. So when should you give the vaccine? When should you give the treatment? And, and how can we optimize it for specific categories of patients 
um, through this uh, virtual cohort. So these are three different examples of, of uh, models that can be used uh, as digital twins um, in different stages of, of uh, the whole R&D pipeline. So what you see here is, a, is a, the, the pipeline in which we see uh, how, how medical products are being developed. So from discovery on the left-hand side, then through an optimization cycle, through to the regulatory decision, um, and then everything that comes after. So in all of these stages, we have examples of models that are used to optimize something or to take a decision to go to the next stage. And even one step further, you can also take once a product is on the market, information that you get, as Louise explained, uh, and use and learn from that data and further, maybe further optimize the product that you have developed. So this is the, the technological part of it. Now, what are the challenges that we're currently facing? Of course, there are challenges with respect to data. We all, you've heard about that with no doubt in the previous uh, trainings, quality, quantity, and access. There are challenges, of course, with model technologies. How do we accurately capture virtual populations? How do we make sure that we can compute this? Um, that does, doesn't take uh, ages in order to compute this because then clinicians cannot really use it. How do we handle comorbidities because then there are multiple influencing factors? How do we connect the lung with the heart, for instance? Sustainability, how can we make this something that is worthwhile because it takes time and investments to make these models? Uh, how do we, maybe they should become part of also health technologies that are assessed and reimbursed uh, when they are essential to make clinical decisions? How do we make sure that the policies are there to use all of these technologies, whether it's AI or other digital technologies? And then there is a the regulatory approval that uh, Luis also uh, already explained uh, quite well. Now there's, and, and on these elements, we're, for instance, also collaborating with colleagues uh, of Luis on, on developing pipelines to demonstrate credibility. How can we demonstrate as technology developers, demonstrate model credibility to the regulator? So what are the different steps that are really needed in order to go there? And there are, now there are more and more standards and guidelines coming. So another thing that we do as a community is try to gather all these things into something called good simulation practice. You have good laboratory practice, you have good, uh, good um, um, manufacturing practice. So we want to also make a good simulation practice. So to gather all that information that people that want to make a model that want to take it to the patient have one place to go and look for information. Now, one last challenge is the uptake. Because if people don't want to use it, and there was a comment in the chat, or if clinicians don't want to use it, or we don't have people that can use it, then of course, uh, none of this can, can really work. So a part of what the VPH Institute is, is doing is building that trust or doing that stakeholder outreach. Uh, for instance, through mapping of what our clinicians already know about using computer modeling and simulation, but also going directly in discussions with patient groups um, in a typical Delphi approach. So first we uh, talk to, to experts and then we do uh, focus groups, which then uh, provides us with a lot of information that we will give back to the research community in responsible research and innovation um, uh, strategy meetings. So one example that you see here is where we worked with experts to design different scenarios that we presented to patients and to healthcare professionals in a focus group meeting, um, where we then use these different scenarios as the starting points for discussions on the ethical requirements on, on you know, would they ever trust something like that? Do they think it's feasible? Um, what, what would you see? What would you like? What would you not like? So there was always an information chart that we developed with our designer and then a short story on the backhand side that were the starting points of these discussions that we had. And we, will, we are repeating these focus groups across Europe uh, and then we'll prepare information packages, of course, for uh, the, the entire community, but also on how to do uh, these kind of focus groups so that you can get in touch with patients and get their input uh, in this, uh, in this um, whole endeavor. And so that brings me to the final point, which is the stakeholder part. Um, I already mentioned, of course, the, the patients and the healthcare professionals. There is um, a lot of other people that really need to be involved and we all need to work together in order to get uh, to the point where these digital technologies can reliably be used um, in uh, the healthcare system. And recently we started funded by the European Commission, a coordination and support action 
uh, which means that uh, it's, a, it's a project that will not deliver a concrete research product, but it is there to help determine a vision and, um, and, and of a future where we want to go to. And this one is called Edith because it is about building an ecosystem for digital twins in healthcare, where we need to get that ecosystem together. So all of the people need to come together, not just the ones developing the models, but also the ones developing wearables, um, the ones that develop uh, interactive um, interfaces with patients, with healthcare professionals, um, the ones, the high performance computing people, the AI people. So all of them need to come together and determine a roadmap. Where is it that we can go and how can we get there? Um, and also, very specifically, the Commission asked us to design a repository where we can collect all these resources, models, data sets, um, algorithms. Of course, there is some overlap with the European health data space uh, when it comes to all of these data. So we're not going to do double work. We're going to see what happens uh, and, and with the implementation of the European health data space uh, for that part. And then we need to uh, design a simulation platform and a platform that allows you see the user actually to engage with all these different resources and say, I have a set of data uh, of measurements of my heart. I want to understand what this means for um, the development of my heart pathology over time, for instance. So that is that would be the ultimate goal. And such a platform has, has of course, specific uh, entry points. You have the entry point for providers. Those are the people that develop these uh, resources. And we need to think about how can we uh, let them upload this? Uh, how can we indicate how reliable the data is? Um, whether it has already gotten some form of uh, regulatory scrutiny? How can we label that data? So what is the taxonomy? All of these things. How can we make sure that the data or that the, the, the resource will be able to communicate to other resources? So there's a whole, um, whole bunch of, of things that really need to be uh, thought through. Then there is the part of the admin part. How can we make this talk to users, the different kinds of users, the providers, um, the, the patients, the healthcare professionals, the R&D people that want to use the, 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 the resource or the, the platform? Um, and so what is it that they would need? How can we identify them? And for instance, if a healthcare professional is logging in, then maybe part of the models that aren't approved for use in a clinical setting will be not accessible. So how can we uh, build these kind of user profiles? And then the users themselves, how can they interact? How can they upload their data? How can they access models? How can they make models talk to one another? A uh, model of the heart with the lung. How can all this happen? So those are elements that we are currently uh, working on uh, to realize that. And so how would this uh, interface then with patients or with users? There you have the, the healthcare professionals on the left-hand side that could use this to understand different options for the patient in, in a clinical decision um, support system strategy. And then on the other hand, there would be the personal health forecasting where individuals would also be able uh, to look at uh, what, what, uh, how to use these models uh, on their, uh, with their own data. That is uh, what we are working towards. That is the vision. So this is not there yet, but this is what the community is, uh, is striving to realize in the next decade. So with that, I'd like to end this presentation and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Lisbeth, uh, for, for this. This is very cool. <laughs> this is very cool. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the question that we had in uh, in the chat has been um, answered. Um, and if not, I would invite Ofra to, to please repeat it and um, take the microphone and repeat it. And at this point, I also invite any other questions uh, to be put forward. If not, I actually have a few. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the meeting. Thank you for the lectures. I wonder, Health Association dealing in Israel dealing with the fertility and infertility, and I was wondering, with all this uh, IE, where is the patient? Where is the art of the doctor, the art of diagnosis? It's okay in the background to have any kind of uh, any kind of uh, uh, big data information and results and so, but at the end of the row, 
you have a patient that suffers, you have a doctor that need to give him some kind of treatment, and first of all, to diagnose him. This is one thing. And the other thing is, you said about individual that use the system, I don't want to read 100% of uh, my condition. I want somebody to tell me, am I in the percentage 71 or 52? Where am I? I don't want to know all about it. I, I want to know about myself. So this is the second one. And the third one, what would you do if 30% of the patient don't have any digital approach at all? So you want to make the medicine available for them too, all the services, all the uh, level of uh, quality, you want it the best for them, but they are not using digital at all. So we need some solution for them. It's a lot of people. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. Much for the question. Can I can I have a, a, a go at that? Um, please, do. Yeah. please do. Thank you. Um, uh, it's 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 very it's absolutely very true uh, what you're saying. I think maybe the um, the mis conception or the, when we present it, we don't emphasize enough that these are not tools to replace anything. These are tools to add um, or to facilitate the life of the doctor and, and the patient. So especially the, on the doctor's side, because there is so much new information coming. There are so many um, different elements that need to be taken into account, especially when you are looking at, at uh, increasing technology in, in, in healthcare, that sometimes it is tricky to get all that information collected. There's also so much new research coming in. So all of these elements can be um, treated with, uh, pre-treated, let me, let me say, with digital technologies so that they can provide suggestions to the clinician who of course will always be the interface with the patient and who will take the decisions uh, for, for the treatments. There are a few cases where you have AI applications or other applications that can directly interface with the patient, but I do not believe, I do not, and I do not um, agree with the future where this this would replace a, a healthcare professional because there is always there's the human factor that is so important uh, that we know that when you talk to a patient, it is also how the patient feels and and what they know of a treatment will determine how successful the treatment is. So those human factors are absolutely important. And I think the hope of the, of the digital community is that by having these additional tools, it would allow the doctor to focus more on the patient because some of the work on trying to um, catch up with all of this that is available is, is being done by the digital technologies. So, and when you talk about patients accessing the system that don't want to know everything, indeed, the option should be there because it's patient data, it's, it's public money. We are making all these tools and all these models. So if you have patients that are interested in doing something with their own data and accessing their own data and in, in using models that they, through their taxpayer money, have also contributed to, well, we need to provide that opportunity. But that doesn't mean that we need everybody to go and check with their smartwatch uploaded into a digital twin and then get the data and maybe freak out if, if the model predicts something that is going completely in, in the wrong direction. So we don't want that, uh, that doesn't need to happen. Uh, and it, we always need to make sure that because we have the human element there, that those patients that do not want to have anything to do with their own digital data, that they do not, that they do not need to do that because otherwise we're creating a, a division that is, that is, uh, that is, really important and that we, we shouldn't make it more unequal. The idea is to use digital tools to make um, medicine more equal for everyone rather than more unequal. And what is the role of the patient organization in this manner? I disagree that the patient has to, uh, to have an access to the data. This is another discussion. But as a patient organization leader, I would like to know what do you think is the role of the patient organizations? Thank you. For me, it is to, to voice, to give a voice to a group of patients, because if we have to go and do the focus groups with individual patients, we do that. But you always get the, the opinions of a few people, whereas a patient organization can, can more easily get uh, 
access or get 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 information to patients and from patients and i think people in the in the in the technology side have finally realized that it's important to not just push something but to understand what is the pull from the patient and so that interaction i think needs to happen at the community level from a patient organization to maybe an organization like the vph so that that of course you can all do that locally but if we can do that from one organization to another we can work for all of the patients and all of the technology providers. Or European level, or local, um, um, global level also. Yeah, global, we're, we're talking to people in uh, Japan and New Zealand in the US. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that we are not reinventing the wheel at different places. Thank you for this. I'm uh, wondering if at this point, Luis has anything to add because otherwise I would, like to perhaps follow up a little bit on our first question um and that has to do with with the data and there was something that Luis mentioned in his presentation about the data quality um when you're talking about the data of thousands and tens of thousands of patients um how how do you ensure in using that that it is representative that, that that it's diverse and that it's actually usable for uh, sort of the entire population or how um how do the users of that know what kinds of populations it refers to and here i'm talking also about the, the inherent bias that can be created by the fact that only some patients agree to share their data, only some patients are able to share their data. Um, and, and that kind of comes with an inherent uh, inequality. Well, that's a, that's a great question. And, and it, it is a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge to, to, uh, to, to uh, ensure um, representativity. How do we do that? So we have to split here two things. So uh, the agency as a producer of information, so we can produce information from certain sets of data we have, and the agency as a regulator. So the agency as a regulator, uh, pharma companies will submit to us certain uh, proposals, like, oh, let's call them like that, certain proposals, uh, and, and that will include some sort of data. And what we have is a community of experts that we can uh, pull on, we, a pool of community of experts that we can call on, uh, that include multiple um, uh, people from academia uh, and other regulatory um, uh, experts, that can help us try to determine the representativity of data. So the way we do it is by expertise in that scenario. The, for our analyses, we know we have uh, uh, potentially representativity issues. And what we're trying to do as, a, as an agency is ensure that we have the most representative uh, data possible across the European Union, considering we are a European Union focused uh, agency. So that involves things like the setup of Darwin EU. Uh, Darwin is, is a, a sort of, uh, yeah, it's a group that has been set up by the agency as, uh, as a sort of expert in real world data, the sort of observational data that we, we can use. Uh, we're not, as users, we don't generate uh, trial data. We can only look at observational data. And uh, what they've done so far, this is this is uh, this is uh, uh, an endeavor that's being led by the University of Erasmus. And what they've done so far is identify ten data partners, and that gives us some level of representativity in Europe. So what we want in the future is that they onboard. 10 additional data partners for the next four years. And at the end of that 10-year period, we'll have 50 databases from across Europe. Uh, that gives us several million people of coverage. Uh, we're still mindful that there are certain people that will not be covered. And potentially those that are covered are those that have very specific characteristics, uh, probably have certain fragility that we should be looking at. So it's always in the back of our mind. Uh, we want more data, we want data representative. We have discussions, uh, uh, significant discussions. 
we're creating um, a data, um, kind of a metadata database that tells us what each data is about. So what kind of uh, advantages and limitation each database has, and that helps us understand what our gaps in knowledge are. Wow, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, final call for questions. Uh, you can raise your hands. I'm mindful of time, and um, I don't. Uh, I don't necessarily want to um, um, take too too much longer of your time. I I, I I did want to ask you, but you've actually answered this in your in your previous answer. How does the the regulator? How do you at the EMA guide the industry about the type of uh, data that can be used to train artificial intelligence. And I think you've pretty much covered that. Um, final question of with for for both speakers. There's a lot of potential, and we've heard about some of the pitfalls and the, the the things that kind of keep you up at night about how to realize that potential. How close are we to realizing the the potential of of AI in assisting? medicines innovation, but also that the, we've talked a bit broadly about the provision of care. How close are we? Are we talking years, decades, months? It, it, it depends on the application. As I mentioned, it's not the technology as such that will suddenly be yes or no in healthcare. There are already examples of cases where AI is used uh, in tools, in in, in, uh, in, in clinical decision support systems. Um, and, and so it is already there, um, but uh, it, it needs the, the sufficient care as it needs the regulatory scrutiny. So that means that there are at this moment many more in development than that are already, that, that can be used uh, in clinics. But it's, it's not a matter of, of if, it is a matter of, of when and, and at what conditions and for what specific application. So it will be one, one uh, one uh, one one example at the time that will be added. So so put add. One foot in front of the other, and and we get there. Okay, Luis? If I can add on that, so I think that's one of the good things I've seen so far is that we're all taking confident strides into moving into this territory of, of uh, application of AI in innovation for medicines in the, in the um, uh, in the uh, in kind of the healthcare setting in general, I think that we're we're careful, and that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. We're starting with the low hanging fruit, so we've seen some applications of artificial intelligence with the easiest stuff. So the things that have what we call some some uh, uh, significant error tolerance, so not mission critical things. It would be very concerning for us if, if somebody came in and said, okay, now we're going to implement this in, in the deciding of who, who takes this drug. That would be very, very concerning to us. But if they say, oh, we're going to implement this in, in deciding what the next molecule we're testing is, that's less concerning for us because that's not, uh, that's not leading to potential um, harmful consequences to the public health, which is our main interest. So that is that is the approach. As as Lisbeth was saying, there's there's already um, useful things out there. Uh, there's machine learning uh, in uh, in, for instance, um, insulin pumps that people carry along. So I don't know if you have diabetics in the call, but if there's certain people that have will have uh, um, some medical devices which are insulin pumps, that is more of a medical device. It's kind of a hybrid, th hybrid thing, but it's a medical device, and there's a machine learning element in some of these that administer drug, administer insulin uh, by measuring um, glycemia, um, and there's some other stuff behind it. But there's really clever things coming out. We already see it. Some of these is is very silent. We might we might not notice that it came. <laughs> we might not realize that's been implemented. Ideally, if it goes well you won't really notice uh, that it's been implemented. Thanks. Okay, so ideally we won't know. Well, okay, I thought mine was the final question, but we have one more. What about liability? Yes, because uh, if the computer decided that they need an injection, an, an injection, and what injection because of the, I don't know what, 
and something happened and I get it, even when I have diabetics and something is wrong. When everything <clears throat> works fa fantastically, it's okay. But what the liability if something went wrong and what can we do against it, let's put it that way, in order to prevent such things? There, there are big discussions on, on that topic. Um, one, one, of course, th this is the reason why you find so many autonomous, so few autonomous AI um, devices that are that are actual medical devices and not wellness apps, because then they have that liability. Um, that is also the uh, part of the reason why having the clinician in the loop as the final decision taker is important. But that is also uh, that also means that the clinician needs to understand why uh, something is suggested. And so the explainability there is also important that we understand how something, an algorithm or a model came to a specific conclusion and how can we put our trust in something like this. So when we have that, then the clinician can take, be confident and take a decision. And then there are still discussions on when something goes wrong, is it the developer of the software that will be uh, liable? Is it the company that sells the software? Is it the clinician after all? So these discussions are uh, are currently being being held by by experts, and they are really important to building trust in uh, in the system in the future. You're you're absolutely right. Any more comments, Luis? I see you've un unmuted. Oh, I'm just going to note that in in the presentation when I talk about the principle, mm -hmm. the reason why I mention them is because mm -hmm. liability is there, right? So we we are aware of that. We we also. It's it, regulatory agencies like to know who they talk to, right? So we want to know who is gonna who's gonna be responsible in the end, and, and that that is an important thing. But as Lisbeth was pointing out, uh, responsibility you can kind of uh, kind of cut it in many different ways. Is it the, it the person that looked at the, the extracted the data that decided to use the data that? Uh, used in balance state or data that's not representative is the is the person that did the model. So so the discussions are still ongoing, but the issue is not going to go anywhere. We're very mindful of, of uh, the need for um, a, a really clear lines of liability in the system. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much uh, for for your answers. Uh, with this, I think I will close the meeting at this point. Many, many thanks uh, to you, Luis, to you, uh, Lisbeth, for joining us today and for for offering us your precious time and expertise on uh, on AI and medicine development. I can announce the next uh, the next AI webinar will take place in in two weeks. We will uh, promote it adequately, and there will be registration opportunities. With that, on behalf of, well, everyone uh, in, uh, in the EPF team, I thank very much to, to all our participants. Many, many thanks to our speakers. The recording will be available on our website uh, very, very soon. Uh, if you would like to catch up or any, on, on anything or uh, if you'd like to spread the word and watch this space because we will soon be publishing um, uh, reports, research reports on, uh, on AI. Thank you very much.